It's always good to have somebody who's from amongst us, and it gives me great pleasure in getting Mike to bring his word here. And um, Mike Maher, where, where does that surname come from? Ireland. Yeah, Ireland. Well, there we go. All right, so no Irish drugs, please. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, and we don't want to talk about the, the Irish guys, no. Okay, Mike, all yours. We just open in prayer, folks. Father, we acknowledge that it is by your anointing, Lord, that we are able to do anything. Holy Spirit, you're the one who anoints us. So we ask, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that you would anoint me by your Spirit that I may speak your word this morning. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would anoint each one of us to hear that which the Holy Spirit would share with us this morning. Lord, when you spoke to your church in the book of Revelations many times, you said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear that which the Spirit says to the churches. And so, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this morning. We ask that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would open our spiritual ears, that we would hear from the throne this morning, God. It's a short time that we spend in, in fellowship with each other, Lord. We have uh, busy days, but may this time, Lord, just be a time of us spending time with you in eternity, Lord. May we step into eternity this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome you, and we trust that you will minister to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. All right, I'm going to be teaching on He has made us priests. And there are six areas basically that I want to deal with this morning. And that is, what is the role of a priest? How often we should pray? Effective and fervent prayers. Pray in our Father's will. Pray with the Spirit. And pray with persistence. The first thing we're going to look at is the role of the priest. <coughs> Revelations 1, 4-6. John speaking. He says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits of God before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us in our own, from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We heard earlier this morning by prophetic word, and also I think one uh, other person mentioned it, the Lord has made us um, ambassadors. We've been made many things by the Lord. We've made, been made sons of God. In this particular scripture, the Bible talks about the fact that we've been made kings to God. At this point in time, we don't really reign as kings. The church at Corinth thought that they did. And Paul said, I wish that you guys did reign as kings so I could reign with you. But it's not our time to reign as kings at this point in time. We reign as kings in our own personal lives. We reign over sickness. We reign over disease. We reign over poverty. We reign over sin. Sin does not have dominion over us. And so in that aspect, we do reign as kings in this life. But the time when we will become kings and rule with our Lord, when He returns, that's when we will truly step into that anointing that the Lord has given us. But each one of us are called priests unto God. And we stand as priests from right now. From the time you come into the kingdom of God, we are called as priests unto our God. That is a, a role that we take on the moment we come into the kingdom of God. We will continue to serve as priests through all eternity. That is something that our Lord has called us to do. But it is an honor to be given the role of priest. And... In this particular scripture, although Paul, or the writer of the book of Hebrews, is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, when he, takes, when he makes this comment, he says, And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. 
He's talking about the Lord when our Lord Jesus was called to be the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That was not something that our Lord took upon himself. That was something that God the Father called him to do. And God has called each one of us to be priests unto God. Jesus Christ, we read that scripture said, has made us priests to his God and to his Father. To our God and to our Father. Guys, we are priests. It is a role that we are called to stand in. It is a role we will be held accountable for. In some denominations, it gets a bit confusing because you're thinking about the, the, the Roman Catholic denomination. I think the Anglicans go to this route. They call their pastors priests. And they kind of stepped in from uh, trying to bring the Old Testament into the New Testament. And a lot of people got into the thing that, well, you know, the fivefold ministry are really the priests. And the laity are not really priests. And they got that from what happened in the Old Testament in the Levites. God took the Levites out of the children of Israel and he made them priests. Not all of the children of Israel served as priests before God in the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant. But they were meant to. If you look at Numbers, when the Lord took the Levites out of Israel, He said, I'm taking these to myself, and I'm making them priests. But in actual fact, they're standings. Because the ones who I've really called them to myself are the firstborn out of all of Israel. And so every firstborn out of all of Israel were called by God to be to serve Him in His tabernacle as priest. And we obviously, the Lord is talking about the firstborn, the male firstborn. But it was obviously impractical to take the male firstborn out of every uh, family in Israel and bring him in to serve Him in the, in the tabernacle. So what the Lord did is that He said, All right, I'll take the tribe of Levi and they shall serve me as priests and the rest of you can carry on with your lives. And so that's basically what took place in people trying to bring that into the New Testament and saying, all right, well, there's certain people that are priests and the rest of us aren't. But under the New Covenant, we're all priests. Because under the Old Covenant, remember what the Lord said, the firstborn of every family is on mine. We read in the earlier scripture just now, in the book of Revelation, our Lord Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. We are in Christ Jesus. We are the firstborn in that sense. And so thus we are priests unto God. Alright, so I, I trust all of you guys understand the fact that every one of us are priests before the Lord. And that's not something that we can uh, get away from. Another scripture about priests. So what is the role of a priest? We know that we're called to be priests before the Lord. Again, the, the, the writer in the book of Hebrews says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. The role of a priest is to offer sacrifices before the Lord. And it's very important for us to look sometimes at the Old Testament because it's a type and a shadow of what we go through under the New Covenant. And it, it kind of helps us to get a clearer understanding of what it is that we're supposed to be doing. So what is this role of priest? Well, a priest under the Old Covenant, you have to offer sacrifices. That, that's the function of a priest. The prophets used to go out and preach the gospel um, under the Old Covenant. Priests used to de uh, declare the law, but by and large, the priestly function was to offer sacrifices to God for sin, for uh, grain offerings, for wave offerings, a whole host of different kinds of offerings. But that was the role of a priest, and, and we're looking at our role as priests this morning. Um, so, under the New Covenant, what kind of sacrifices do we offer? 1 Peter 2.5 says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we don't get to offer up bulls and, and, and rams and those kind of things these days, and I'm thankful we don't. But we get to offer up spiritual sacrifices before the Lord. And it's important, guys, we understand that. We are called to do this. This is a part of every single child of God's calling, is to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God the Father. What are the spiritual sacrifices that we offer? 
Hebrews 13, um, 15 says, Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. The fruit of our lips is the sac spiritual sacrifices that we offer to God. And in that incorporates prayer. When you, when you praise in the Lord, you are offering the fruit of the earth. That's the sacrifice of praise that you're offering unto God. When you worship the Lord, our, our Lord said, The Father is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We worship Him with our mouths. We pray, we bring petitions before Him, supplications before Him with our mouths. And so it's in prayer that we as priests offer sacrifices before God our Father. It's very important that we acknowledge the fact that we are called to prayer. That is our main function as priests. Remember I said a priest is called to offer sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that we offer before the Lord and that is prayer. Intercession is, a, is, is prayer as well. And so that is one way we, we, we stand before the Lord and offer sacrifices. The Lord speaking when he was uh, in the temple, he says, They taught saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. When the Lord made this comment, he was standing in the temple. And he had just basically driven everybody out of the temple, the guys that were selling and the guys that were uh, bartering in the temple. Uh, at this particular recording here, Mark records it at the Passover that the Lord was about to go before the crucifixion. This is not the only time that the Lord drove people out of the temple. John's Gospel tells us when he started his ministry. The Lord started his ministry at the Feast of Passover. He ended his ministry at the Feast of Passover. And when he started his ministry at the Feast of Passover, John tells us that the Lord drove everybody out of the temple. Now the other writers of the Gospel tell us at the end, the last Passover, that he drove everybody out of the temple. So, John didn't get it wrong and neither did the other writers of the Gospel get it wrong either. The Lord chased them out both times. I guarantee you the Lord chased them out in between as well. Every single time that our Lord went to that temple, and He didn't go there very often, guys. There was only certain feasts that the Lord attended when He was, on, when he was in His flesh. Uh, Feast of Tabernacles we know about. Feast of Passover we know about. The cleansing of the, of the temple we know about. The other feasts we don't know about. But that's one of the reasons why the Lord's quite unpopular with the high priests and the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day because believe you me they were getting their cut from the guys that were selling at the, at the temple and when the Lord disrupted business as it was uh, he was not a popular man that's why they approached him and said who gave you this authority who said you can do the things that you're doing he had just cleaned out the temple and now he comes back to them he says my house shall be called the house of prayer the Lord is quoting Isaiah when he does that and it was the fact that God had set up his house as a house of prayer that temple that the Lord was standing in at that point in time was destroyed. Our Lord predicted it would, and it did happen in AD 70. But when our Lord hung on the cross, the veil was torn in two. And that temple that was destroyed no longer exists. But we are the temple of the living God. Amen. And so the purpose for the temple, although the temple itself has changed, there's no longer a physical structure there, it will come again. But there's no longer currently a physical structure there. We are the temple of the Most High God. The purpose of the temple of God has not changed from one covenant to the next. We are called a house of prayer. And so we're called to pray before God our Father. That is something that our Lord Jesus has called each one of us to. We minister under the new covenant in the heavenly tabernacle. We don't have a physical tabernacle. We, we have a physical tabernacle. We live in and the Holy Spirit lives in each one of us. But when we offer up our sacrifices before God the Father as priests unto God the Father, we minister in the heavenly tabernacle. We come into the Holy of Holies. 
Paul said again, the writer says, Come boldly, we can come boldly into the holy of ho holiest of all through the veil of his flesh and through his precious blood. We have access into the holiest of all. And when we minister as priests here on earth, we affect heaven. Church, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ is one church, but it's currently in two locations. You have the church that's in heaven and you have the church that's here on earth. The church that is in heaven have rested from their works. Book of Revelation says, in 14, 13 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So every one of our brothers and sisters who have gone home to be the, to with the Lord before us are currently in heaven resting in, in heaven. The Bible talks about the fact that prayer is labor. Um, Paul speaking about Epaphras, I don't know if you pronounce his name right, he said he, he, he labors fervently for you guys in prayer. And prayer is a kind of work, folks. Um, it's not uh, something that people take to with open arms, for want of a, a, a better... The flesh hates to pray. Get up in the morning and pray, the flesh rebels against that. And it is a labor. It, is, it does take effort to get on your knees and spend time before the Father in prayer. It is labor. And we do it on this earth. We're the only ones who can add to the incense in heaven. The incense that are presented before the Lord. Look at the scripture. Revelations 8, 3 to 4. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. We're the only ones at this point in time who br bring petitions before the Father, who intercede before the Father, who bring supplications before the Father. The church in heaven does not do that. The church in heaven prays the Father, worship Him, bow down and adore Him, but they do not petition Him. They don't come before Him and pray for so and so salvation and pray for this person to, to be turned to the Lord and pray for healing for such and such. They're our witnesses. The Bible says that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. They're looking at us and they're saying, guys, we've, done, we've run our race. Now is your time. So on the earth, the church that's on the earth is the church that contributes to the incense that's offered before the Lord. It's at this point in time, we offer the prayer of incense before God our Father. And we do that through the sacrifice of prayer. Um, and that prayer is a labor. So, question comes up now, as priests, how often should we pray? Again, getting back to Hebrews 11, uh, 10, 11 says, And every priest stands ministry daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. And so the old covenant priests were called to offer sacrifices daily. So the question is, well, okay, does, um, under the new covenant, does that apply to us today? And a lot of people will say, guys, don't get into works now. We're not called to works, we're called to grace. We are called to works. We're saved by grace. The Bible says, I'm saved by grace through faith, and that not of myself, it is the gift of God. And so I believe in Christ Jesus my Lord, and I'm saved through His blood. What He's done for me, He's done for me. I could not do nothing about that. It's grace that got me into the kingdom of God. And grace enables me to function in the kingdom of God. And one of the functions that I'm called to do is I'm called to be a priest before God. And so His grace enables me. When Paul complained about the fact that he was having a hard time from the messenger of Satan, the Lord's response to him was, My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. You've got enough grace. Stop complaining. Get on with the work. The Lord is interested in our works. In the church, in all the book of Revelation, when the Lord speaks to the churches, every time He addresses the churches, and this is one of His churches right here, He says, I know your works. The Lord Jesus is very interested in our works, guys, because it's our works 
that will be judged before him on that day. Not our salvation, that's settled. We're going to heaven. Every one of us, we're called by God, we're his sons. We go to heaven. But each one of us will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account of that which we've done in this earth today. And so yes, we are called to do works. It is something that under the, under the, 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 the gospel of grace that we're called to do. So just how often should we be praying? Should we be praying daily like the, the Old Testament saints? Well, our Lord said something when the, the disciples asked him about prayer. You all recall the incident? Our Lord was busy praying and the disciples were watching him. And when he finished praying, he walked over to them and one of the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And we all know that the prayer that the Lord taught them. And we'll, if we get time, we'll have a look at that. But one of the comments is that the Lord made in that prayer, he said, when you pray to the Father, pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread. So the Lord is implying here, guys, this day our daily bread. You're on your knees before the Father every day to ask Him for this day your daily bread. We are called to pray every single day. It's not an option. We're under grace. And God forgives us. And God does not say, you didn't pray today. And thus, lightning comes down and you get a bit of a haircut. And that's not the case at all. We're under grace. But we're still called to pray. And we are called to pray daily. It is something that the Lord has taught us. Let's have a look at a scripture that I, I like to look at quite often. 1 John 2, 6 says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate example we have as to how we should live our lives. When he said, folks, I am the way, the truth and the life. The way it has multiple meanings, but one of the meanings is, this is it. You want to know how to, do, how to live life? I'm the way. I'm showing you how to do it. Look at me. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we're called to imitate our older brother. Our Lord Jesus walked this earth. When our Lord Jesus walked this earth, he walked as a man. He was the Son of God, but he never walked this earth as the Son of God. He walked this earth as the Son of Man. He never performed one miracle until he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Only after he came out of the, uh, the wilderness, in the power of the Holy Spirit, do we then see the Lord starting to perform miracles. His ministry started to take off. Getting back to the comment that I made earlier, just in case I lost some of you here. When I said that the Lord began his ministry at the Feast of Passover, God works according to his calendar. All right? The feasts that were put in place, God the Father put them in place. God the Father will operate according to his calendar. Remember the Lord made the comment to his mother when he was at the, uh, the wedding in, in Cana. And she said, you know, guys, whatever he says to do, do it. Uh, because they'd run out of wine. And the Lord said to her, Woman, my hour has not yet come. Why did the Lord say that? Because his hour hadn't yet come. He had to start his public ministry in Jerusalem at the Feast of Passover. Read the Gospel of John and you will find out that at the Feast of Passover is when the Lord began his public ministry. Prior to that, he had been ministering just to his disciples. He had been calling out his disciples, Peter, James, John, Andrew and a number of them. But he had just been ministering to those disciples. He hadn't yet launched his public ministry. And that, that's why he said to, the, to his mother, my hour has not yet come. Because he knew he had to still go back to Jerusalem at the Feast of Passover. Then his hour would come, launch of his public ministry. Another time our Lord said, it is not my time. Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord's brothers, who didn't believe in him, said, you know, you want to have a ministry, you want to proclaim to the world that you're the saviour of the world, you know, go up to, the, to, to, to Jerusalem and tell everybody. What's our Lord's response? He said, uh-uh, my time has not yet come. For this feast, my time has not yet come. What was the Lord saying? He was saying prophetically, 
My time will come. Our Lord returns at the Feast of Tabernacles. God sticks to His calendar. And so that is when, that's what the Lord was meaning when He said, My time is not yet come. We know the Lord went there in secret afterwards and He did minister there. But that's what He was saying prophetically to His brothers at that time when He said, My time for this feast has not yet come. His time for this feast will still come. That's why the Gentiles, when the Lord does return to the earth, will be required to to acknowledge the Feast of Tabernacles they will be required to come and offer gifts at the time of Feast of Tabernacles because that's when the Lord returns to the earth during the Feast of Tabernacles so we have some idea when the Lord is coming back anyway let's have a look at the, the prayer life of our older brother and let's just see exactly how it is that he uh, walked this earth remember as a man you have to understand this Get your mind around the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God, never walked this earth as the Son of the Living God. He walked as the Son of Man. He went through exactly the same weaknesses we do. I guarantee you, getting up early in the morning to pray, he's his body said to him, Oh, please, let's just sleep a little bit longer. I guarantee you that he, the Bible says the fact that he was tempted just like we are. He can identify with our weakness, sympathize with our weaknesses, because he went through what he, he lived in the same kind of body that we live in. And he, he relied completely on the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said, I can't, guys, I can't do anything of myself. In and of myself, I am nothing. I can do nothing. God, the Son speaking. Because he... He had to minister under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit. Luke 5, 16 says, So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Luke 6, 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Mark 1, 35 says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Psalm 109, 4 says, In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who was the spotless, sinless Son of the living God, who, of all people who ever walked this earth, could have claimed the anointing just because of his lifestyle, spend many hours in prayer before the Father. I guarantee you, this was, the Lord didn't start praying when he, came, when he started his public ministry all through his life as a young boy. Our Lord would go out into the wilderness and pray. This was his routine to get up. We do have men around this, this, in this forum who get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and pray. And I'm not saying that we need to do that. I'm just saying, we're looking at our older brother now. We're looking at him. The Son, the son of God spend much time in prayer he needed to spend much time in prayer are we any better than him our Lord says guys it's enough that you be like your master but you can't be better than him and if he needed to pray believe you me we certainly need to pray as well and so our Lord Jesus Christ gave us an example another psalm and I'm not talking about fasting now but this is just one I wanted to throw this in Psalm 109 uh, 24 this is the Lord speaking he says my knees are weak through fasting but I give my uh, sorry and my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness we know that the Lord fasted when he went into the wilderness in the 40 days and 40 nights the Lord also fasted before he went to the cross he had no fat on his body when he went to the cross. He had been spending time with, with that, that, that part in the scripture where the, 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 the Lord is walking towards Jerusalem and he passes the fig tree and the, the scripture says and he was hungry. He was hungry. He had been fasting because he knew what was coming. And so he'd been spending time before the Father in prayer and spending time before the Father fasting. So I just wanted to bring across the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ spent a lot of time in prayer. Another scripture. Then he came to the disciples come up there. Yeah. and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Lord kind of made a comment there to, the guy, uh, to Peter and to John and to James, because those were the three that he pulled aside. He said, Could you not watch with me one hour? That particular night, the Lord prayed at minimum three hours because we know He came back three times. Um, but it seems to be that the Lord is saying, guys, an hour of prayer 
Is it really that much to give to your father? To stand in and minister to God the Father as a priest? Is it really that much? Let's have a look at some other examples in scripture. Psalm 55, 17 says, Evening, morning, and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Anybody know who said that? David. David said that. Evening, morning, and at noon I pray. David was the king of, 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 of a country. He was our equivalent of a president of a nation today. Believe you me, you go speak to any president who runs a nation, their, their calendars are very full. They have a hectic life uh, schedule that they've got to keep to. And yet David set a time before the Lord to pray three times a day. We know another person who did just that. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt on his, on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. So here's another man, had a very hectic schedule. Tom? Scripture. Oh, okay, scripture is Daniel 6.10. Sorry. Daniel 6.10. Um, another man had a very hectic schedule. He was the governor of one of the biggest empires this world has ever known. And yet he gave three times a day to spend time in prayer. I'm not saying that we need to be given time three, uh, three times a day. I'm, I'm just sharing the Bible here. As the Holy Spirit leads you guys, apply it into your own life. Alright, so that's all I'm doing. I'm not trying to convict anybody. I'm just sharing what the Lord shared with me. We are being really convicted. Okay. I, I've shared this before and I've had that response. And my sincere apologies, but it's not me speaking. It's the Holy Spirit speaking. So let's just give him the grace. Yeah, the thanks due to his name. Alright, so the next thing I want to look at is effective fervent prayers. And I've asked Dieter to just shut me down when we run out of time. James 5, 16, 17 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land three years and six months. Before Elijah goes, if you know the story, the first time we see Elijah in scripture, he just pitches up at Ahab's um, palace, I suppose, and he says, it will not rain again until I say so. And then he walks out. And that's, uh, that, that's Elijah's access into, into the Bible. But before Elijah made that comment to Ahab, two things had taken place. One is God had spoken to him and said to him, Elijah, I'm going to be bringing a drought upon the earth. I want you to go tell Ahab. Elijah then got on his knees and prayed. James reveals that to us. He said he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three years and, uh, three years and six months. You say, well, where did you get that from? Go have a look at what happened when the Lord said, okay, now we're going to have rain. The sequence of events that took place there was God said to Elijah at the end of the drought, he said, okay, Elijah, it's time now. I'm going to bring rain. Go tell Ahab. And so Elijah, in response to that, goes and tells Ahab, after the whole episode with the prophets of Baal and all that, but at the end of that, he says, we're going to have rain. But what does Elijah do then? He doesn't say, okay, well, God said we're going to have rain. I proclaimed it. I'm a prophet. I proclaimed it. We're going to now have rain. He doesn't do that. He gets on his knees. And he starts to pray for rain. God the Father has spoken to him. He's just performed fantastic miracles. Everybody's seen it. But now he gets on his knees and he starts to pray. And so guys, we must also understand sometimes, get wisdom about prayer. When you get a word from the Lord, it's not a case of, okay, well God's spoken, it's going to happen, I can now go and relax at the pool. Quite often when God speaks, He expects us to pray. That's what happened with Elijah in getting the, 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 uh, the rain to stop. 
and in getting the right to start. He sends his servant up there how many times? Seven times. That servant had to go up there. He goes up, he checks, he says, there's nothing. Elijah says, go back. All the time that he, go, he, he sends his servant up and down, Elijah's on his knees, he's got his head on his knees and he's praying and he's interceding before the Lord. And then that little cloud appears and, and Elijah gets up and he says, that's it, we're going to have rain. Alright, so as I say, use some wisdom sometimes when the, the faith message quite often preaches, but claim it, believe it, and you got it, and then just keep thanking the Lord. That's not always the case. There are some instances where you need to actually stay on your knees and, be, and pray until some evidence, that little cloud does appear. And then you can get up. And then you can prepare for what the Lord is going to do. I've kind of jumped ahead of myself here, but we're talking about um, praying effectively. One of the first things that you do when you pray effectively is 1 John 3, 21 and 22. Remember our role as a priest, okay? Think about your role as a priest. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things which are pleasing in His sight. If our heart does not condemn us, is the operative word in that particular passage of Scripture. Guys, when you come before the Father in prayer, the first, 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 first thing you do is you wipe the slate clean. Our Lord said, and whenever you stand praying, Mark 11, 25, 26, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. We cannot come before the Father in prayer and have unforgiven sin in our lives. Now I'm not talking about unintentional sin. The Bible deals with unintentional sin. We don't have to worry about that. The blood of the Lord cleanses us from that. The Bible says that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and His blood cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unintended sin. The, and under the old covenant, when the high priest is to go in once a year and offer up sacrifice for sin, it was for sin that was committed unintentionally. During the year... If you knew you had committed sin, you used to have to go to the, uh, the, the priest and offer up a sacrifice for your sin that you had committed. And so what we're talking about here is known sin. You cannot come before the Father in prayer with known sin in your life and expect the Father to hear your prayer. With known unforgiveness in your life and expect the Father to hear your prayer. Clean the slate before you come in. The Old Testament, the priests had to first offer up sacrifice for their own sins and cleanse themselves before they could enter into the presence of God. God's not changed. He hasn't had a makeover since we came into the New Testament. And now He was a God of wrath, and He was a God of holiness, but now He's a God of love and a God of grace. Same God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. No change. He's as holy as He ever was, and He's as holy as He ever will be. And so if you want to come into the presence of the most holy God as a priest and minister to Him and offer sacrifices before Him and have your sacrifices accepted by Him, better you come into His presence clean. Alright, so the first thing. Your heart will not condemn you if you take those steps. Well, the scripture says very plainly, John, 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's not a complicated issue for us to get, us, to get uh, forgiveness from the Lord and get cleansing. But it's a vital step that has to be taken. Next scripture, 1 John 5, 14, 15 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of Him. And so then one of the steps that you're taking, praying before the Father, is find out what God's will is. Before you bring your petition before the Lord, just take time out to go search the Word of God and make sure that you're understanding what God's will is concerning the petition that you're bringing before Him. Because the Scripture is very plain that if we ask anything according to His will, 
He hears us. God's will is that we be healed. God's will is that people be saved. God's will is... Yeah, I, I can go on and on and on. I, I don't want to go down that road. But have a look at what James says in James 4.3. He says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so it's not God's will that we should be able to gratify the desires of the flesh. And he's not going to answer those prayers. So you know, don't waste time praying to the Lord about things that are outside of His will. Seek His will before you go before the Father in prayer. Another scripture, John 16, 23, 24 says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. We have been given power of attorney in, with the name of Jesus. He's given us power of attorney. Some of you are legal minded around here understand that concept. That you have, you have an absolute uh, the authority to use his name. The Lord Jesus Christ has said, guys, you've never asked anything for, in my name before. I'm asking you to do that from now on. From now on, use my name. I'll endorse every prayer that you utter to the Father in my name. I'm sitting right next to the Father. And when you pray in my name, I'm going to say, Father, hear that prayer. That's my name he's using. And God the Father listens to that prayer. It's a powerful um, tool, for want of a better word. Not a good word, but want of a better word. Next scripture, Mark 11:24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You cannot pray before the throne of the Almighty God outside of faith. If you do not have faith in what you're praying for, don't expect God to answer your prayer. He will not violate His word. He will not violate His word. He is a God of faith. You come before Him and you ask Him for something, believing you receive, you will receive. And so it is by faith, guys, that we receive from God. It's by faith we came into the kingdom of God. It's by faith we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's by faith we're healed. It's by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. When we come before the Father, we pray by faith. Another scripture, and I think I'm going to just finish on this section. I won't go to the others. Hebrews 5.7 says, and this is quite a... a, a, a an eye-opener, it was quite an eye-opener for me, many years ago, but anyway. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. We're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. The spotless Son of God, sinless Son of God. And what does the scripture says? The scripture says, and he was heard, his prayers were heard because of his godly fear. That godly fear is reverence for the Almighty God. Jesus came from the, the, the Father. He walked as a man, but he, he hadn't lost it. He knew what, he, what, what heaven was like. He knew what the glory was like that he had with the Father before he came to the earth. He knew what God the Father was like. He knew all about the 24 elders and the four living creatures and how all the angels of God bow down before him and worship him. He knew about the majesty of God. He knew all of this. And so in that knowledge... When he came before the Father in prayer, he came with godly fear. The one who was fully acquainted with the throne came before that throne with godly fear. And the Bible tells us that his prayers were heard by God the Father because of his godly fear. Guys, when we come before the Father, it is the Almighty God we come in before. It is not a case we don't come to say our prayers. We come kneeling before the Almighty God in reverence, acknowledge Him for who He is. It will make your, pray, your, your problems that you bring before the throne so small when you realize just how powerful and how almighty and how holy our God is. Our Lord Jesus had that attitude. How much more should we not have the same attitude? It, when you come before the Father in prayer, come. It's your time of reality. It's your time of reality. It's not a time where we come in in a religious attitude. Look at what Allah, look at this, uh, it amazes me. My Lord, this is what he did. With vehement cries and tears before God the Father. Tears should not be infrequent in our prayer closet. 
prayers should not be infrequent in your prayer closet. If, they are, if you are not bursting out into tears time and again as you kneel before the Father in thanks to Him for who He is and pouring out your heart, this is the time that we are real before God. When you come before the Father, He knows exactly what you need before you get there. He knows what you're going to say before you get there. We heard that, I think, being prophetic work this morning. He knows everything about you. And so, you know, be real before the Father. The Lord Jesus was. He cried before the, uh, the Father. And so, guys, you should be completely open before God. This is your time with God. One on one. That's why the Lord said, get into the closet. Don't go and do it on a street corner. This is between you and God. It's one on one. You're pouring your heart out to the Father. He acknowledges that. He, he appreciates that. He certainly did with his son. And we are his sons as well. Okay. And one last thing on this particular one. Watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. I've already mentioned, before we come into the kingdom of God, uh, before we come into uh, the, the, the presence of God in prayer, God knows exactly what we want to ask. So don't come in there and just pour out your petitions before the Lord. Don't just come in there and, and just start, oh Lord, you know what this is, then you know, I need this. And and the Lord taught very often, watch and pray. He always placed watching before praying. Have you ever wondered what he meant when watch and pray? What does it mean to watch and pray? Come into the presence of the Almighty God after you've cleansed yourself, after you have given Him thanks. We enter into His courts with thanksgiving, uh, into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. After you've given Him all of the honor due to His name. Shut up. And just sit quietly before the Lord. Be still and know that I am God. Elijah, when the Lord spoke to him, in the still small voice. Now, obviously, the Old Testament prophets, I still envy them in a way because they got to hear the voice of the Lord audibly, which we don't in the New Testament. Some of us do. Some of you had the experience of that, but it wasn't very often. But, I mean, the, 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 the prophets used to hear the Lord that way. But in this particular instance, we see where the Lord spoke to him, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but a still small voice. And so when you come before the Father, first here, you're dealing with the Almighty God. Let's hear what He wants to say first. And so just kneel before the Father. After you have given thanks, after you have given Him all the adoration due His name. And then just let Him speak to you. And then, in response to that, uh, it's, it's such a blessing, guys. Uh, time and again, the Lord mentioned something to me in my prayer life that I would not have prayed about, I would not have thought about. Just last week, or a week before last, I was praying for a group of people that I pray for, and the Lord just said to me, pray for so-and-so's health. And so I did. I prayed for that person's health. I didn't know. The next morning on Facebook, oh, Facebook, yeah, um, they posted they're going in for operation that day. I knew nothing about that. I was able to post back and say, the Lord laid you in my heart last night to pray for your health. And that was such a blessing to that person because that person just knew, okay, well then God's got my best interest in this whole thing. He spoke to somebody that I've never even spoken to for years and told them to pray for my health. And I was a bit concerned I'm going. And so... Have time to just wait upon the Lord before we present. Okay, thank you guys.